earlier in January, I did an experiment with the energy of play because I wanted to understand how intuition, instinct, and play all map together. The more that I invited the energy of play to work with me and my consciousness, the more I realized, oh, snap, I don't really know a lot about play. And here's why. Over those four and a half months of this experiment, I was simultaneously trying to grow my business. And I was trying to branch out into new territories and try new things and push myself outside of my comfort zone. What ended up happening was I became so singularly focused on my goals that play went right out the window. That every single activity that I was engaging in had a purpose tied to it. So I used to play by reading books and I used to really love that and enjoy it. But then because I was tying so many of my goals to the point of reading books to grow my business, it quickly became not fun anymore. And then I started doing the exact same thing to working out. Working out used to be really fun for me. I loved being in my body, loved being outside, but then I tied it to some specific goal that my body had to look like or some specific outcome for how my energy was to be managed. And lo and behold, the energy of play took a hike out of that activity too. Now track this all the way down to my business. Absolutely. Same thing happened. I used to love researching and sharing information, much like in this channel, and sharing new information with my clients. But then I started tying a bunch of goals to it, and play just seemed really far away. This isn't to say that your goals are bad. My goals are not bad. But what happened was my consciousness got overtaken by something else. It was the drive to succeed at all costs. And anybody who's worked a job with high demands, anybody who's an entrepreneur, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The drive to succeed and the drive to make something out of yourself is so strong and powerful that everything else starts to fade into the background. So what do we do about this? Well, hopefully this information is useful to you in reconnecting with the energy and the spirit of play. Now, when... You're working with a big energy intuitively. That energy does take on kind of a persona. It's almost like a spirit that comes to hang out with you and it will teach you about itself if you invite that in. If you want a really great read on it, it's Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. She talks about inspiration as being kind of the spirit that roams around the planet looking for someone to participate with because it has an idea that it wants to share with somebody. And so the inspiration kind of lights on somebody's head, lights up a light bulb, and they get that, oh, look it, I just got an idea for a new book. The thing is, is if you don't work with the inspiration energy pretty immediately, that inspiration is going to leave you. The idea for that book is going to leave you. That idea on its own is going to go to someone else. And this is actually documented quite a bit. Elizabeth Gilbert in that big magic book has a really fun example on how this works. But one of my favorite examples is also called multiple discovery, where the spirit of inspiration for a particular scientific idea roams around the planet and lights upon the head of two or more scientists and they get the exact same idea at the exact same time. They've never spoken with one another. And they're probably on opposite sides of the planet speaking different languages. But that is a bit how these energies work. They roam around looking for someone to engage with them. So if you're serious about learning about the energy of play in your life, invite it into your life. Invite it to teach you about itself. It very much will. It's also going to show you where you're blocked and you're not able to receive that energy. So first thing about play, play isn't serious. Okay. Yeah. I know that's like a duh, but spend any time next to a high achievement personality and like I said, they're going to tie a goal to everything that they do. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does tend to kill the spirit of things. And it does tend to make things pretty serious. 
When it comes to our culture, we are so addicted to efficiency and productivity. That's what it means living in a hyper-capitalist society that we are um, obsessed with making things more productive and more efficient. But here's the deal. When you do that to yourself, that's called an internalized pressure to be more productive. That's the first thing that's going to kill your instinct of play. The point of play is that there is no point. So take a look at your life. When was the last time you read something for fun? When was the last time you read a book of fiction, perhaps, and not a self-help or an entrepreneurial guidebook? When was the last time you took a hike just because you felt like it, not because you needed to optimize your steps or get in your workout routine or something along those lines? Do what you can to unwind the mountains of expectation that you have on your activities. And again, I'm looking at you type A's out there. You don't need to have so many expectations tied in with everything that you do. In fact, that's probably working against you. It's probably low-key pulling you out of the adventure and the enjoyment of life. Okay, next. Play is primal. What is a primal need? A primal need is eating, sleeping, hydrating, relationships, movement. Play is primal. It's included in those primal urges. Now, I spend most of my days helping high-performing executives become more instinctual because intuition on every level is simply pure instinct coming from an uncluttered mind. So to say that play is primal, again, we're linking it to other instinctual urges that we may have lost connection with, those urges and those instincts that come from our body. Again, obsessive productivity tends to knock our primal awarenesses and instincts way out of whack. We sleep like crap, we eat terribly, we don't move our bodies enough, and we start focusing on quick fixes to manage our bodies and our energy rather than being with our bodies and our energy. You see the disconnect here. So if you're trying to be a more instinctual, intuitive person, you've got to link up and get those balanced activities and instincts back on track. Eat better, move your body, and play. I also talked about not operationalizing everything. And so I realized a little bit of the dichotomy of this talk is that we're talking about not optimizing play, but at the same time, it is important to make sure that play is well-rounded within your routine. I guess I'm just trying to point out here how important it is to disconnect from the grind and do some non-performative silly shit anytime that you can. Here's the next point. Play is movement. It begs for physical in-your-body movement. And I learned this one through quite a bit of resistance, totally in the name of overthinking. I was trying to learn about play by intellectualizing it, which kept me glued to the furniture, grinding away, trying to understand something with this that needed to be understood here. So in sharing this, remember that if things have become really serious in your life, you're probably low-key reinforcing some thoughts like, I don't have time for play because I'm too busy working away on my next goal, or I don't have time for play because what if my next big idea comes and if I'm out playing, I'm not going to hear it or I'm going to miss it. But here's the thing. If you're out playing, you're re-engaging your relationship, not only with your own body, but with the world itself. You are very, very likely to get inspirations from being outside and playing, from engaging with this world. Innovation does not happen in a vacuum. And innovation is rarely a serious pursuit. Seriously. (laughs) Cultural history suggests that all of our best innovations come with a crap ton of effort and grind and 10,000 ways of how not to do things. And that is true. But to get to that next big idea, you need to give your brain a chance to work with the environment and to observe what is and what exists out there. 
can't all be just between your ears. Neurocognitively speaking, when you're out playing and you're moving your body, you're also oxygenating your brain, which enhances your focus and concentration and memory. And again, we're not optimizing play, but you need to know what its benefits are. So in sustaining your body level awareness, play is going to be very, very useful. Also, if you're prone to massive runs with your work, like you can study three or four hours in a row, take a break, get outside, play, let the air hit your skin. It'll do wonders for you. Last point on the concept of play is that play does not exist in the absence of challenge. I think that's a misnomer here that sometimes people think If I'm going to play, it needs to be easy or it needs to be effortless. And that's not always the case. What play requires is stimulation. And you're not going to get a lot of stimulation if the activity is super easy. You will get bored. Similarly, new ideas and innovations come from a series of thoughts and insights and experiments and challenges and activities. And all of those exist as kind of a chain of events. You don't know what chain of events or thoughts or activities are going to lead you to your next brightest innovation. You have no idea. And so it's important to engage with these things in a non-organized way to encourage a little bit of that stimulation, a little bit of that challenge, so that your next idea can come to you. So here's a really random experiment for all my type A's out there that need to have everything structured. (laughs) One day, how random can you get with your agenda? Can you plan a day where you're just straight adventuring? Maybe you go try out a new trail or you go attend a poetry jam and you're not even into poetry. And then you take a DIY class on how to make a backyard bird feeder. Doesn't matter. And then you go for a a night out dinner and line dancing. Okay, super random example. I get it. But here's the point. You're going for multivariate stimulation. You're going for all of these activities that don't seem to have a point or a purpose. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's a bunch of random activities that you wouldn't normally engage in that's going to spark new thoughts, new observations, and it's going to do wonders for your creativity. So if you're having a hard time discerning what play is to you, You are so not alone in this. I had a heck of a time being like, I don't even know what I like anymore. I've been so stuck in my grind. So here are some play personalities that I thought were really helpful. First, there are the collectors who generate their sense of fun by seeking out interesting objects or experiences to collect. And you know somebody like this. They collect wine, they collect shoes, purses. Maybe they're a total foodie and they collect experiences at restaurants Comic books, that used to be me. (laughs) Coins, cars, it doesn't matter. They get joy and they sense play out of collecting things. Uh, For social activities, they might do this by themselves or they might link up with similar uh, people who have similar interests to share about their adventures. The next play personality is a competitor. Probably know one of these. You might be it yourself. They love the thrill. They're playing to win They engage in activities that are super adrenaline fueled and they tend to be more of the social sorts. These are the folks that love pickup games, basketball, football. They tend to be fairly physical in that, but they love the sheer adventure of it all. And these are the people who know that play is also challenging. If it's too easy, they'll get bored. Next, play archetype, the creators and the artists. Bet you can't guess what they're into. Their joy is found in the act of creation and creativity. And their activities generate a bit of tension in that process, that creative process where it doesn't come easily or obviously, they tell you that's actually part of the stimulation. So if you're a creator or an artist, are you making time for your art? Are you making time for your love? Are you expecting it to be easy? Try to engage with it. Try to challenge yourself if even just for 30 minutes this weekend. Next group, directors. If you have one of these in your life, give them a hug because they're doing a lot for the social dynamics of your group. 
These are folks that derive a lot of their play satisfaction from planning activities and executing on those plans. So these are your event organizers. My sister is one of these. She's always planning family activities, which is brilliant because I'm not so sure we'd remember to hang out with one another if she wasn't constantly making sure we had opportunities to get social with one another. So again, if you know somebody in this camp, they're amazing. Next are the explorers. These are people driven by the hunt and the journey of the unknown. They love seeking out novel, new experiences that challenge them physically, emotionally, or intellectually. They might be exploring a new topic. They might be exploring a new restaurant. They might be flying across the globe to experience a new city. It doesn't matter. These people are the explorers. And then they come back and they tell us what they learned and super cool engagement. That is a form of play. Next, you've got the jokers. Okay. Who doesn't love a good laugh? Who remembers their class clown? Was it you? You're amazing. My favorite part about jokers is that they can liven up any serious environment. And if you need examples on this, on how this works, watch a few episodes of The Office to see how useful joking and practical jokes can be to any environment. And all I got to say is Beats, Bears, and Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Kinesthetics are people on the move. They play from being embodied. They play by going out, moving and shaking their butt, yogaing and dancing their way to feeling good in their body. If this isn't your normal play style, but you want to experiment with a couple of different new avenues of play, I highly recommend befriending a kinesthetic because they, they just know how to engage in that play as movement thing. So partner up with somebody or take a class from a kinesthetic, they will show you new aspects of your own instincts that are really, really helpful. And also kinesthetics in business meetings, they tend to be really tactile. So you might see them doodling or drawing while in a business meeting. It's not to be disrespectful. That is actually helping them focus. And last but not least, one of my favorites are the storytellers. These folks play in their imagination. They connect to the thoughts and feelings and emotions of characters, usually in books and in movies. They create tons of landscapes in their minds about human interaction and human behavior and how all that works. So think of the George Lucases of the world. Think of Steven Spielberg. Think of your intuitives who are mapping the world using their minds to tell a story. This is actually a very, very useful part of not only play, but as part of your intuition, because visualization tells a story about what's possible. We'll get into that at some other time. But if you're looking to discern what your play personality is, I'm including a personality quiz link that somebody else did. They did a great job with it. Take the quiz and then ask yourself these questions. What helps you to feel ridiculously alive? What helps you feel like, hell yeah, I did that. That was amazing. Or it helps you feel like you breathe a sigh of contentment simply because you did that activity. Guess what? You're playing. And it's important to keep those activities in your life because all work and no play makes you a dull person. And we'd be better off seeing the lighter side of you, the side that wants to engage in something that has no point and is not serious. Would love to know how these tips and tricks worked for you. Subscribe and comment below. Thank you.